All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm David Kim. I'm going to be your host today. So before we jump into things, you can see that Dr. Fio here is waiting, have her slides ready, but I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. And so really quickly uh, in the chat, please drop your name, where you're based out of, and let's make it a little fun. What's the best career advice you've been given? Um, so some quick housekeeping. Today's workshop is going to be recorded. We're going to have slides. We're going to share all that after the facts. And if you have any questions, please use the button in the bottom right of your window to submit a question, and we'll get to them at the end. Dr. Fio, before I introduce you, I'm saying doctor here just because you said I can leave that out. Before we jump in here, what is the best career advice you've been given? I think one of the best pieces of advice I was given was to build a network of peers and mentors I could reach out to outside of the company I was working in that I could reach out to if I ever encountered a content issue or if I had, um, if I wanted an objective opinion about something I was doing. It's not something we often tend to do, particularly when we're working inside the company and kind of get absorbed by it and live in a sort of company bubble for a while. But it's, it's very valuable to reach out of said bubble and amplify your network. Peers, mentors, content friends. I love that. That that was also the best advice I was given to, to learn from people outside of your company, for sure. So let's jump into it. Here we have yes. Dr. Fio Doceto. She is the editorial lead at Postmark, a fast and reliable email delivery service for developers. She's also founder of Content Folks, which is an amazing newsletter for folks in content. So go there to contentfolks.com to subscribe now. She was previously uh, editorial lead at Wildbit and senior editor at Hotjar. And today she's gonna to be teaching us about product-led content. So Fio, the stage is yours. All right, thank you. And thank you for inviting me and thanks for everybody to come here and build our small little network about content. So we're gonna talk about content that sells without being salesy. And actually we're gonna talk about product-led content marketing, which is probably to me and maybe to you, David, as well, the single most underutilized tactic in B2B content right now. I've been giving a few variations of this talk for the past three or four years. And still to this day, I don't think a lot of people are doing it. So my goal for today is to talk to you about what product-led content is, um, why you should do it, and show you some ways that you can get started with it. Um, and the way I usually do it, and we're gonna jump right in, is by using an example taken from the movies and TV, because I think it illustrates the point really well. So there's usually three ways that a product can show up in a movie or in an episode of TV. And let me, ooh, I'm doing a thing I shouldn't be doing, hang on. Yes, so the first, um, the first way the product shows up is what I call a level one blink and you miss it. The product is technically present in the frame on your screen, but it's not really acknowledged. And you may or may not notice that there is an Xbox controller on the table there on the left hand side. It's technically there, but because it's not actively part of the story, it may be invisible to you as you're watching the movie. Now, the same happens with a lot of content where the product is technically present on the page, but it's not really acknowledged. So, here, for example, is a blog post about how to avoid mistakes if you're a, a manager. And it was published on the blog of a company that sells employee management software. Um, there are some links in the write-up that if you click them, um, they might take you to a product page or to another blog post that takes you eventually to a product page. But you can still very much blink and miss them because you're not actively directed towards them. And you can scroll past them without ever realizing that the people behind the write-up also have a tool that they can offer you. The second way a product comes into a, a movie or um, a TV episode is the level I call direct mention, which is where your attention is actively directed towards the object. So maybe a character looks at it or references it directly, interacts with it, Somehow, as it happens here with um, the two characters are name dropping and discussing the game that is being played and you are alerted to its presence and are aware of it. Um, the same is true with um, content. It happens, for example, when you get to the bottom of a piece like this one 
and you discover that the folks behind the article also have a product or a service that can help you do some of the things that the article talks about. So in the final uh, paragraph here, your attention is directed towards this company's service and you learn that you can get in touch with a sales rep, get a demo, etc. So this piece is one step ahead compared to the previous one in that at least you get a product mention or a service mention, but it's still kind of a throwaway mention if you think about it. Now think about these two and compare them with this one. Level three, crucial plot point. This is the level where the product is a crucial part of the story. So here, because this is the holiday season, I thought I'd do something topical. And here is a Christmas movie that came out last year. It's called 8-Bit Christmas. Um, that's probably one of the most product-centric movies I've ever seen because the entire plot here hinges around a group of kids in the 1980s who set out on multiple quests to get themselves a Nintendo for Christmas. That's all they want and it's fun and you see Nintendo is everywhere in this movie and kind of really makes you want to play a game yourself. So with this in mind, level three content is content where the product is also an integral part of the story perhaps less madly than in this movie. But here's, for example, a piece that I published when I worked at Hodger, as you mentioned before. Hodger is a tool that helps you understand user and customer behavior. So here you're reading a guide about the importance of getting customer feedback uh, to, to grow your business. And halfway through the piece, you're given an example of how the product can help you do it very practically. It's not a blink and you miss it uh, mention, or actually it's not a blink and you miss it link, like level one. It's not a throwaway mention like a level two. It, it actually pairs the theory of how to do something with the practice of how you can get it done in the tool itself. It shows you what the dashboard looks like. It shows you how the things work, what you, uh, how the thing works and what you can do with it. And as they read the piece and you, and you keep seeing the product there in front of your eyes being used, you start forming a mental association between Hotjar and the job of doing customer surveys. And if you click on many of the links that are available on this page, what you see is um, you'll find more content that shows other facets of the product in action. For example, here is a different page for the same website. It's a different type of survey, for us, but um, it's a similar type of product mentioned in a screenshot from inside the product. So altogether, Hodger will start looking like a very good candidate to help you learn about customers and grow your business, which is the reason why you came to these pieces in, in the first place. And if we did our job right, you'll want to run surveys because you've seen how easy it is and how fast it is, what results you can get. And you've almost test driven the product while reading. So let me give you some other examples. For example, here's a postmark. It's a piece I recently wrote about email deliverability. And throughout the piece, I added a bunch of screenshots from the dashboards that show you how postmark can help you see deliverability errors. And I also added um, very straightforward captions that tell you as an audience member exactly what it is that you're looking at. So you're familiar with the layout of the product and also which part of it you're looking at. Um, here's a, a piece that I wrote for Ahrefs about content marketing. And again, here I was talking about proving the ROI of your SEO work. And then I simply took a screenshot from the dashboard and I annotated it to, to give an example of the kind of data points you could look like you could look at um, in Ahrefs. And in fact, small side note, um, so far I've just covered content that I worked on, but if, if you want to see product-led content done really well, um, I recommend that you just take a look at the Ahrefs blog because pretty much I can guarantee 90% of the time you land on, on one of their content pages and you'll find one, if not multiple mentions of the product or screenshots, annotated screenshots or small mini tutorials in line that help you to teach you how to do the thing you came there to learn about. Um, the same also happens, for example, with the folks at SparkTor, who I think in the last few years have really nailed the weaving of the product into the larger story or into the larger guide of how to do something, in this case, um, how to do effective cold outreach. So compared to the pieces I called level one and level two, these kind of make the audience familiar with what the solution 
actually could look like. So uh, let's, let's be clear, L level one and level two are competent write-ups, but they don't really have a distinguishing feature. And in fact, sometimes if you remove the, the header from, from the page, you wouldn't necessarily know where you are. They could be published anywhere. Um, you, you wouldn't know that the company behind the write-up also has a product um, that they can help. Nor would they have any way of imagining, like as an audience person, you wouldn't have any way of imagining yourself using it because you literally have no idea what it could look like. And so we come to the summary of what I like to call product-led content, which is content where the product is woven into the narrative to illustrate a point, solve a problem, and or help accomplish a goal. And in fact, I asked Carissa to help me here because I'd like to know at this point, uh, what type of content do you do most often with your teams? If it's a level one, level two, or level three, I just like um, to know. And I'll tell you why, because this is where I usually start encountering some resistance and gentle pushback from marketers or marketing teams who haven't used this approach before. I feel like a lot of us content marketers um, are kind of reluctant to put the product in our content. Um, we either think we can't or we shouldn't because we don't want to come across as too salesy, as too pushy or too biased. And because there is this idea that putting a product in your, in your content is not very customer friendly, particularly on pieces like, let me move, like these ones, long form guides and articles that, or deep dives into a topic that are some of the most common types of content that we write for our B2B audiences. And usually when you have titles like these, um, the most obvious execution turns out to be a level one or a level two piece where the product is hidden or mentioned in passing. Um, almost as if we were afraid to offend the customer by offering a solution. And now to be clear, I, I really believe that as marketers, we all want to do good work. We all want to be genuinely helpful. And with that in mind, here's the first of three reasons why I think we should do more product-led content. It's because actually, if you think about it, it's the most customer friendly thing to do. So if people come to you with a problem or need or a job to be done and you have a solution, I actually think it's your duty as a marketer to present it to them and make them do less work. So they don't have to read your piece then go back, Google for some other solutions. They don't have to spend extra time doing research or they don't have to follow seven links to a product page. Um, to be clear, I've seen some examples of content where the product is shoehorned in clumsily, or I don't know, you, you're halfway through the page, you get a giant CTA flashing at you in the middle of the page. Now that's not really what we're talking about. I'm talking about content where the product is woven in naturally without breaking the flow, without using a hard sell. Much like in the Nintendo movie actually that I showed you before, which is done really tastefully. And it doesn't come across as a shady product placement or as an extended advert. That's where I think the, the, the creative part of, of our skill as content marketers comes in. Um, the skill is making the reader want to use the product because you made it very clear to them that it can be beneficial. Now, there is a second reason, I think, aside from this being the customer friendly thing to do. It's an approach that can help you have a tangible impact on the business. Now, if you watch the, the video that um, Alex published um, to present this, this uh, evening together, he made the point that um, you can create the, the most beautiful, the most compelling, the best written research design and laid out content marketing world. But if it doesn't generate ROI, you will get in trouble, or at least some questions will be asked of you and your team. And again, you, you do need to have um, an answer, particularly at a time like this one with a lot of layoffs and looming recessions and all of that. Now, in my experience, this kind of content can actually work to support both acquisition and retention. Acquisition because you reach people early on in their journey with pieces that are usually aimed at building 
brand awareness, brand equity, etc. But you use them to position your product as the de facto solution there and then from the very start. And you start creating associations in their mind with between uh, the, the job to do or the problem to solve and your product or service as the standard solution. And um, if you, like me, can trace first touch signups, so this is how we measure the success of our content. We, we, tra we trace first touch signups back to content pieces. You can actually see how this kind of approach over time will significantly help with your acquisition plans. Also, this content supports retention. Because you need, you need to think about it like this, just because um, somebody is already a customer, it doesn't mean that they know about or utilize 100% of all available features and functionality. So um, content that helps surface product features and functionality that existing customers might not be aware of or might not be actively using can actually help them stay with your product for longer and inspire them to give it a try. So this seems to me like a really solid reason to try this approach next. And the third one, um, as I was saying before, not many companies seem to be doing this. So this seems like a really good reason to give it a try because you can get a competitive advantage. You, you get to showcase your product and solution, um, present it in your product as a solution and present it in action to um, anyone at any point across the funnel um, where the rest of your competitors maybe are not doing the same. And so now the question, I hope I convinced you that this is an approach worth trying. And now the question becomes how to do it. And this is where we move into the practical part of this. And I'm going to give you three methods for uh, creating or editing content in a product-led direction. First, we start from the aha moment that inspired um, my product-led journey. Back in 2017, I was watching this um, course from Ahrefs, a team I mentioned before. It was called Blogging for Business. I think it's still available on YouTube, even though the product mentions in there are a bit out of date because they have since evolved and changed the dashboard quite a lot. Nevertheless, they had this slide here where we're talking about a method for prioritizing content, um, depending on how much of your product you could weave into it. And the scores went from zero, where you have, we have a topic where you have no way to mention your product, to three, which is where your product is the irreplaceable solution to get the job done or solve a problem, a challenge, et cetera. This slide really made me rethink the way we were doing content marketing at Hotjar. And we took this and I turned this, so Ahrefs called it a business impact score. I called it the Hotjar ability score. And basically we started marking all our content pieces for Hotjar in terms of how Hotjarable they were. So we assigned scores of zero to three. And then we decided to prioritize pieces where you could see um, where you could apply a score of two or three at least. And sometimes that meant prioritizing content pieces where the traffic potential was smaller. Parenthesis, this is because we used SEO as our distribution method, so we were interested in growing traffic organically. But as I said, um, sometimes that meant get focusing on pieces where the potential traffic was smaller, but because the hot durability factor was two or three, um, it was a clear way to showcase our product in action. And so we went with that. So let me show you again, method number one, which is what I've been talking about, um, keyword based. So as you would, if you're using SEO as your distribution method, you start by researching relevant keywords. And again, here is uh, an example of keywords that we were actually actively working on at Oddjar back then. So. As you normally do, you, you search your keywords, you look at global volumes, traffic potential, difficulty, et cetera. Then this is where things become a little bit different. You bring in the business impact score or the hotjar ability score. Now that I work at Postmark, I call it the Postmark ability score. So you can just call it your company ability score and it will be fun. Um, the way you do it is you essentially ask yourself questions such as, can I explain the topic using the product? 
can the product do this thing directly? What parts of the process can the products help? And have I heard of customers doing it? So here, for example, you see how topics like customer satisfaction surveys or market research have a Hotjar ability to score or two or three, because of course you could definitely use Hotjar to do customer satisfaction surveys. And you can also use Hotjar to do some parts of market research. So this is how we pick those two topics and prioritize them above the other ones. And then you would add your unique angle because again, just um, to make it clear, just because a piece is SEO driven, doesn't mean it has to be a carbon copy of everything else that is already out there. In fact, what we tried to do at Roger was try to add a unique angle, a controversial or unusual take that would make our content stand out. So in this particular case, for example, we, we made the argument that you didn't really need to spend tons of money um, in market research. You could start small, do it yourself, and then this is a piece, exactly, it's a guide to market research. At some point, we bring in Hotjar and we show you exactly how to do part of the job utilizing the tool. So again, you can be smart and have your own take, your unique vision of how something can be done, and then bring in some practical examples to show how your product can help people do it. And when it comes to executing it, so when it comes to actually creating the piece itself, there are different ways that you can um, weave the product in. Sometimes I just started the sentence by saying, if you're using Hotjar on-site surveys, this is what it might look like. Sometimes I introduce an editor's tip or a friendly tip. Sometimes I just had screenshots and very specific captions that explained what people were looking at. So we made sort of a pact with our teams that uh, whenever a concept could be illustrated using Hotjar or Postmark or whatever tool I'm working with, um, we would make sure to add them. And over time, you start collecting a lot of pages like this one, and then they all compound and the journey across your blog or your guides, etc., becomes very consistent and very clearly about, um, about your product. So let me just check what we're doing for time. Okay. Second method. So this one was SEO driven. The second method is customer based. And I hope that you're here listening and recognizing yourself uh, doing customer interviews over Zoom, because I do this all the time. Um, not everybody does it, and I really recommend that you do. Essentially, you want to talk to some customers, and because you're doing this, the hot jar ability or postmark ability or whatever, the business score, is already two or three because they're, you're talking to customers about ways they are actively using the product. Um, and you want to run interviews and just ask questions and be curious about how did they do something specific using the product? What did they accomplish? What did they learn? What would they change or do differently? And what kind of pro tips do they have for, for folks in their same situation? And then as always, you can find an angle and hopefully a keyword. So here you see an example of a piece that we wrote after running a customer interview and learning that a customer had figured out a really smart way of creating user personas using Hotjar. So we could have ended the call and decided to write a tutorial called how to do customer personas with Hotjar. But instead, we decided to go one step higher and we decided to create a guide to user personas in general, which in this case was a very voluminous keyword. And then we've Hotjar in throughout the story of how to do customer personas, using it as an example of how a specific company had done it. And we added the unique take of um, creating something simple and accurate without leaving your desk, which is, again, standing out from every other result about what are user personas and what and why you should do them. Um, and again, these, this is just like some screenshots from this very long guide about user personas, which side note, still ranks really well for its, its head terms. Um, and here you see how we brought in the, the, the tool. We explained what it had looked like for the customers who were using it. We showed step-by-step step of how 
the reader could replicate the set setup if they wanted. We even show them what the results might look like. So if people reply to the survey, what kind of results they could expect to see in their dashboard, etc. So this gave a really comprehensive idea of, you know, how the reader could, if they wanted to use the personas themselves as soon as they were done reading um, this guide. All right, so, so far we've talked about, um, we've covered new content pieces, which is, again, the, the situation I, I found myself in when I joined Hotjar back in 2017, because there really wasn't much of a blog there and we had to create a content marketing program from scratch. But now I've joined Postmark and I have 10 years of blog and guide histories. In fact, I have like, there's hundreds of blog posts and pages that I can work on. And so there is a huge opportunity in optimizing your existing content and optimizing what you already have. So here's the method, here's the method I use. First of all, I look at successful pieces and successful ears in, um, what do you call them, quotation marks? Because what's successful to me might be different for your team. So for example, you could look at pieces that receive a lot of traffic or pieces that get a lot of engagement, pieces that convert incredibly well, pieces that do well on social, whatever your definition of success is. Start by finding um, those pieces. Step two is, as always, apply the 0-3 impact score. Now for me, it's a post-markability score. So I ask myself, can I weave the product in? And if I can, doesn't mean I should. Does it, does it feel natural? Does it add any value? Uh, and when the answer to all of this is yes, I then work on editing. And usually the edit doesn't require a larger restructuring of the piece. Uh, usually there are smart, small ways to bring in your product with screenshots as part of the existing story. So let me just show you an example here of a before and after or something I did very recently. This is a piece about um, Gmail reputation bounces, which is, again, a technical topic, but there is a really good way to mention Postmark as an alternative solution. In fact, the way I started introducing it is simply by saying, as an alternative option, Postmark is one of the very few in the service providers that can help you, blah, blah, blah. And then I showed, uh, I added a link Actually, no, I didn't. I added the uh, I added the screenshot. I should have added the link. I probably will now that I think about it. I added the screenshot of the dashboard that sort of mirrors what I was just talking about in the paragraph above. And so you can see how this doesn't take a lot of time. It takes a bit of time to think about the best way to weave a product in, but the execution itself doesn't take too long. And again, it can yield really good results. Um, especially when you start doing it consistently across all your content properties. So we talked about product-led content. We talked about what it is. So content where a product or service is woven into the narrative. I hope I gave you enough reasons to convince you to give it a try because this is a type of content that helps you really be customer-centric. It helps you drive growth and also gives you competitive advantage because not many people are doing it. And we talked about three methods for doing it, two um, by starting new content, SEO driven or customer driven, and one by optimizing existing content. And this is where I tell you to try it and report back and let me know. And hopefully we have some questions and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you for listening to me so far. I don't know if I'm the only one who can oh. hear you, there, but I can't nope. hear you. My fault, I was muted. Thank you so much for that. I love product-led content, and I think it's generated a lot of interest because we have a lot of questions for you. So where should we start? Um, there, there is an interesting question here. So um, Sona Anonymous asks, does product-led content only work for SaaS with a freemium model or strong PLG motion? So I'll, I'll tell you my answer, and David, I also want to hear yours. The answer to me is no. This kind of content works for everything. It works if you're selling a product. It works if you're selling a service as a consultant or as an agency or whatever. It's obviously easier to do if you have a premium product and if it's software, because it's very easy to just take screenshots from a dashboard and show you how a product works. It's a little bit more complicated if you're a consultant or selling less screenshotable 
services but i think it works absolutely fine as well and it also works for um b2c by the way it also works with um physical products like i don't know shoes or stuff like that i don't know why i think about shoes but anyway you get the point i think it works for are, everything is this your experience as well david are, are you in a market for some shoes i uh, yes <laughs> this is exactly why so <laughs> there you go looking at shoes right here. yeah um i i totally agree with with what you said it it applies to maybe any or most business models maybe in this question here the only difference is maybe for a PLG motion, you can actually see it's easier to correlate uh, or directly attribute blog visits to a product signup versus maybe enterprise. It's a longer cycle to convert. So it's harder to do the attribution, but totally agree it applies to, to a lot of businesses. Um, but even then I would say, yes, with, with enterprise, right, the time to conversion is much longer. However, I think this really helps because usually what happens is somebody will be either tasked to do some research or tasked with recommending tools. And if you've actually showed them what the tool can look like, there is less of a surprise. I think don't underestimate the importance of showcasing your products at any possible opportunity because the leap of faith required to convert, however long the conversion window is, is much smaller when somebody kind of knows what the product looks like, doesn't really have any surprises compared to the, the, the major leap of faith that I'd say that you take when you have no idea what this thing could even look like and what you can do with it. So it works in all cases, I'd say, but across different time frames and it can get measured differently. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. It's it's might be poking fun a little bit if anyone is an enterprise software, but you go to most enterprise software companies and you have no clue what the, the product actually looks like. And you have, you have to get a demo to see what it looks like. Um, I did not realize that until you mentioned it. All right, next question here. Is product-led content essentially just middle of the funnel or bottom of the funnel content? And how do you use it for more top of funnel content? So this is where I think I'm gonna say something slightly controversial or this proven controversial before. I actually don't think about the funnel at all because as I said, I think this kind of content supports both acquisition and retention, and it can be positioned at any point of the journey. Um, I think I had an easy life at Hotjar because you could really talk about Hotjar at very top level levels if you want. So um, I was showing before in my slides, there were some keywords that we were going after, and some of them were like company values or future of work. And, even in stuff like that, we managed to talk about how Hodger was using Hodger to see how our team was doing, etc. So I think I had an easy life there. And because this content supports retention really well, I don't just think of it in terms of the funnel that ends at a conversion. I, I think about it after as well for what it can do. Um, and some of the topics I showed before, I would argue that they might normally be qualified as tofu as well like the general guide to user personas or contactless payments or i don't know how to train your sales team whatever some of the the titles were there um i still think they are mostly the pieces that we normally write to create brand awareness brand equity etc but there is still a way to put the product into them yeah yeah it's interesting I, it seems like maybe the general way of thinking about tofu mofu bofu is bottom of the funnel is talking about like the best live chat software so it's clear you're going to talk about products and in mofu i know people define that differently so i won't go into that but for tofu it might people would generally think about it as very top of funnel never going to use your product but the way you're describing it is people who do user personas are all sorts of people um and uh you figure out a way to communicate how hot jar fits in and solves for that challenge or job to be done that they're trying to accomplish. And so, mm -hmm. sure, someone could have written it as an ultimate guide to user personas, but never talk about the product. Um, yeah. And they can make it something that'll never convert people. But you're saying, hey, if you're writing about something, hopefully it solves for your persona. So therefore, your product should also solve for them. Yeah. Again, I think the point is, hopefully, you're creating content to 
educate an audience or help them do something, um, you know, because you know that they have a job to do or they're facing a challenge. And again, if your product is part of the solution, which I think is primarily the reason why you're writing about the topic anyway, um, then I, as I said before, I think it's actually your duty to show it in action and to help them make their life easier. So, yeah. Yeah. So we, we have some follow-up questions from Anonymous. So my, I'm making some assumptions here based on their question. Um, sounds like they have a complex enterprise software. And so they're asking, mm -hmm. uh, how do you use product-led content to support an enterprise sales motion? And what if it's a complex product that isn't easily screenshotable? In addition to there being complex products that aren't easily screenshotable, which I don't know, maybe if you're using APIs or really technical stuff, there is also a lot of companies who don't want their products screenshotted because they don't want the competition to steal their secrets. I actually think this is a this is not an infrequent objection to creating content that showcases your product in action. So um, what was the question again? What if it's a complex product or how to do it? Well, how to do it if you're selling enterprise content. I think mm -hmm. whatever kind of content you are currently creating, um, I, would cons I would think about what are you talking about? Who are you talking to? Are you offering solutions? And is there any point where you can bring your own product in? And if yes, why aren't you? Um, I think maybe it's a bit of a simplistic answer, to be honest. But again, I think as I go back to my previous point that you can pretty much put your product into anything you write and you create, whatever the asset. It doesn't have to be a blog post. It could be like, I don't know, it could be a temp template gallery if, if this is the kind of stuff you're offering. It could be like a video. I could be whatever. So depending on the kind of assets you're currently working on, um, I think there are ways of doing it. David, what yeah. do you think based on your experience? I, I do wonder if the question comes from a place where because most enterprise software companies don't do this, mm. it seems like it's not the normal thing to do. And in that case, I would encourage this person <laughs> to definitely do it to, to different, unless if there's, of course, fear of competition and all of that, which yeah. um, I had in my previous company. But I, I have the same recommendation as you. Um, even if it's a complex product, you can do notations on the image to show, to describe what, what exactly you're showing on the screen. And if you're targeting the right persona of the content, ideally they understand what you're pointing out. Annotated screenshots or small uh, GIFs or small videos work extremely well for this as well. And yes, to your point, it may be that nobody else in the industry is doing it. So it doesn't look like the right thing to do, to my previous point, this is where you get competitive advantage because not many people are doing it. And you, if you do it, get to position your product as a solution while everybody else is making their product invisible. So I think it could be a really good win. Yeah. And maybe from a, a buyer's point of view, I've actually chosen to work or use certain products because I saw their product on their website and got, knew what I was getting versus I don't want to get on a demo to see a product. Um, and so it, it, it might help actually against competition as well. So we, we have a question from our team. So from Ali, our head of content, um, she, how do you think about outsourcing product led content successfully, or is it even something you should be outsourcing? So I'll give you the long answer here. Um, I was extremely lucky at Hodger to have been a customer before. So I knew the product inside out and I could write competently about it without really needing help from anybody else. I have now joined Postmark, which is creating a product that is absolutely not for me. It's for developers and it's absolutely nothing I understand because it's all about APIs and technical stuff. And frankly, I am way out of my debt. So in that sense, uh, having me or outsourcing to a freelance is very similar because again, my knowledge of this is zero. Assuming the freelancer also doesn't know about the topic. Um, the best way to do it is to make sure that you're setting up your um, freelancer or teams you're outsourcing to whatever you're setting them up for success and this might mean 
getting them in touch with customers, giving them access to um, customer customer success logs uh, where they can see how people ask questions, talk about jobs they need to do, and what answers they are they are given by the team. Um, ideally, set them up with a demo and some sort of tutorial. And best of all, if you can actually give them an account and teach them how to play around, um, that might help. I appreciate that this is really time consuming, especially when teams are publishing big volumes of content. You can't really just, well, I mean, I think you should potentially uh, require that all your writers are trained in the product, but that's not what happens sometimes. But then in that sense, if you outsource it, having a really strong brief or a really strong understanding of how the product can be woven in and working with an editor on your team to do these kinds of edits in or to direct the uh, the writer or the person you're outsourcing to uh, might work as well. In my particular case, I am running customer interviews. I'm also interviewing team members and begging them to share their screen and show me how they're doing the thing that I'm going to do try to explain to other people. And it works really well. I love that. And I think that goes back to your advice earlier on. It's it's networking within a company, but still breaking out of the marketing department and speaking to oh, other yeah, folks sure. at the company to learn more about the company and the product and how that can be embedded in your Yes. Because actually, as a follow-up, we were talking here about outsourcing, but I'll, hopefully a lot of folks here work on teams where they can talk to and make friends with product managers, sales, product marketers, sales teams, or customer support teams, et cetera. Building bridges across the business is actually a really great way to start creating product-led content because very often there are a lot of ideas that your customer success or support team have because they know what kind of problems people come to you with and they could inspire you to create some content. And if you have a sales team, that's probably true as well. They would have a really good idea of the kind of content guides, tutorials, help, etc., cetera, um, that potential customers need and want. So make friends with people on your, com on your companies, yeah. other teams. And you, you mentioned, I think on one of your slides where you find, uh, maybe a keyword to match up with some of the product-led content that you're producing. What if you're in a space with very small search volumes? How do you think about it then? Again, as I said, um, I don't quite care. And I don't know if it's just because I'm incredibly fortunate or you know, I was very persuasive with my teams. But again, sometimes, especially in very niche B2B, you'll find that it doesn't look like there is much volume, but one, the tools don't necessarily pick up volumes when they're small. And two, just because there isn't volume today doesn't mean there won't be volume tomorrow. And so I think I do it anyway, especially because with this hot jar ability or postmark ability or whatever score, um, if it's an opportunity to talk about the product, if somebody comes there, even if it's in small numbers, uh, but if they come there with a very specific need and I have the solution, that's quality wise, that's actually really good compared to having masses of untargeted traffic come to me and then do nothing. Yes, 100% agreed. And I hope you continue to say that through all your presentations. <laughs> I think sometimes these tools become a crutch that we depend a little too much on um, when we know we should be knowing our customer and trusting our gut on some of those calls. And again, I'll go back to the point of making friends with folks inside your team because you will spot trends like your customer success and your sales teams know trends that the SEO tools have not picked up because they're talking to humans on a daily basis. And, you know, SEO tools, as good as they are, are, are just taking a sample and it's not quite the same. So, yeah. Yeah. So those are all the questions we had around product led content. I did want to ask about some content you recently put out on your newsletter, Content Folks. So a reminder to folks, okay. content, contentfolks.com. We have it in the chat for you to go subscribe now. You had mentioned, uh, you talked about this easy framework for content. Ah, okay. How does product-led content tie in with that? Okay, so the easy framework I like to talk about as probably my greatest contribution to the world of content marketing, which is a stupid thing to say, but it's basically a, a framework for approaching the creation of content that is easy, 
as in expert, actionable, simple, and yours. And the whole point is to look at content and make sure that your expertise is showcased. And by expertise here, we mean your knowledge of how the product uh, can help folks who are reading or watching or listening to your content, um, how can I help them achieve a job or oh, sorry, do a job that they need to do, achieve a goal or whatever. So expert, actionable, because ideally what I want my content to do is to cover all the potential questions that somebody has so they, they can read it and they don't have to go on a separate Google search because I told them what something is, but I didn't tell them how to do it. And again, product-led content works really well here because if you're doing it properly, you're going to pair the theory of how something is done with the practice of how you can do it with the particular tool that you're screenshotting and annotating, etc. Easy, actionable, simple, um, which is the hardest of the four things to do. Because again, um, you're talking to audiences who come to you with a problem or a solution and you want to clearly succinctly explain how they can do the thing that they want to do. So no jargon, no buzzwords, no black hole words of unclear meaning, etc. And finally, yours, yours is just basically giving yourself license to be creative and to put your point of view, your brand's point of view, your company's point of view into the content. So you're not creating clones or copies of everything else that is around, but you're actually helping people while sharing a strong point of view. Um, I mentioned the folks at Spark Toro before, they're doing this incredibly well. They are really opinionated marketers and they will let you know about it and they will tell you what's right and what's wrong according to them. And then they will show you how to do something with their tool. And it's great and it stands out from the rest of the content, which is very often a copy paste or a remix of a lot of other pieces out there. So. Expert, actionable, simple, and yours. I hope it helps. I love that. And maybe one last thing for a couple of the folks um, here who might be thinking about becoming better at content marketing in general. You had also written about uh, thinking like a senior content marketer. Hmm. And you put that number one on that was putting strategy before tactics. Um, what I found working with a lot of folks is it's natural to jump to tactics. So maybe yes. what's your advice for helping more content marketers build that strategic muscle and start thinking more like a senior content marketer? Yeah, I, th I think this works with time, first of all, but a good way to think about it is to start thinking beyond what you're doing and trying to understand how the thing you're doing is impacting the people you're writing it for, if you're writing in the business in the larger sense. So it's not just, you're not just writing a piece because you need to hit a word count. You're writing a piece because you're trying to get somebody to take this action. And if they take this action, this it will have the following kind of business impact. And that will mean X, Y, and Z. So like think in the long term or about the longer impact of what you're doing. And if it doesn't come naturally, because I think this is a muscle that needs to be exercised, hopefully you can have somebody on your team to mentor you. So actually, if you have senior folks above you, ask them to point you in this direction and to show you what the larger picture looks like and what you like, how your contribution fits into it. And if you don't, because you're a team of one, which we often are, um, we go back to the very beginning of build a network of mentors and peers. And again, ask them for guidance and also observe how they talk about success and how they measure success and try to see if you can bring this, that back to yourself and the work that you're doing. Amazing. I love that you just wrapped that up to the advice you gave yeah. in at the beginning of all this. So come, Those come are all the questions. Circle. Yeah. Theo, thank <laughs> you so much for making time to join us during your cross country move uh, and teaching us about product led yeah. content. Uh, for the folks who joined us, hope you've learned something new that you can apply starting today, hopefully before the holidays. Um, and go to contentfolks.com to get more helpful insights from Theo. Um, you're going to get a survey. Would love your feedback on how to make this event better. And our next office hours is with Ashitosh Priyadarshi, who's founder of Sansama, who also has a great content uh, program over there. So definitely check them out. And that's on December 6th. So save your seat for that now. Um, with that being said, Theo, thanks so much for the time and for joining us today. And thank we'll you for inviting me. And thank you all for coming.
Take care.